It's in the armor. Why does the country of Detroit send their men out to die in these things? In the European theater of World War II, both Allied tankers and their German counterparts coined the term Ronsons for the American Shermans. This based on the popular slogan of the Canadian Ronson cigarette lighter, always lights the first time. Throughout the campaign, the late model German Mark IV, with its high velocity 75 millimeter gun, and the even more powerful Panther and Tiger, outclassed most models of the Sherman in firepower. In the Pacific theater, however, the story was far different. Here, the smaller Japanese tanks with their weaker armor and low velocity guns were no match for the Shermans. On Peleliu in 1944, Marine tankers destroyed several outgunned Japanese tanks in one day of intense tank-to-tank -tank combat. There's a tank there ahead of you if it's enemy fire on us. There's a tank dead ahead. One of the Jap tanks got behind one of ours and was blazing away at the back of the Sherman. I remember screaming at our tank to look back when suddenly, the Sherman's turret swiveled 180 degrees and let loose a 75 millimeter round that blew the turret right off the Jap tank. It continued to run for a ways like a beheaded chicken. Though well documented, tank to tank battles were relatively rare occurrences in most theaters during World War II. The more common experience for tank men was slugging it out with entrenched enemy infantry and artillery. It was a type of combat that hadn't been taught in the cavalry-minded atmosphere of the armored training schools back in the States. Instead, it had to be learned by experience in a brutal game of trial and error. When the first shell hit, I was afraid like all of us were. We were told in training, don't freeze. I guess a few guys did. They got so petrified or frightened, they just froze. But I kept saying to myself, don't freeze, watch. So I didn't freeze. But I was damn scared. To many soldiers, the Sherman appeared to be a massive fighting machine, able to move at high speed and simply crush any obstacle in its path. When the weather was fair and the terrain was solid and flat, this was certainly the case. However, the battlefields of World War II were anything but hospitable to the tanks and their crews. From the quicksand and rugged mountains in North Africa, to the mud, ice, snow, and freezing temperatures in Europe, the tankers constantly struggled to keep their vehicles moving. A single broken track or clogged carburetor could completely immobilize a tank. Indeed, throughout the war, most tank losses were due to mechanical breakdown, accounting for no less than 75% of losses in some formations. We cannot operate in the ground below. It is too soft. Is that clear? Over. The sheer weight of the machines often became their own worst enemy as they frequently bogged down in the mud or were hampered in fields that had been pounded into glutinous soup by intense artillery barrages. Many Allied tankers were faced with a dangerous problem when they entered the narrow Bocage, or hedgerow country in northern France. I never knew what a hedgerow was. When I saw those hedgerows, I said, my God, no wonder nobody can see anything. They were taller than the one-story houses, and the hedges were so close together that you couldn't see nothing. My God, traveling down those roads, all of a sudden, bam, a shell would smack one of the lead tanks, and the lead tank would pull back. Sometimes, it would just knock it right out. In the Pacific, Marine tankers faced equally brutal conditions in their island-hopping campaigns. In the often intense tropical heat, the crews battled the uneven, swampy conditions in dense South Pacific jungles. 
the tankers developed their own methods for dealing with the foul terrain. We followed trails. When there wasn't any trail, we would just start through the jungle. When we got balled up so much we couldn't go anywhere, we'd back off and with the canister ammunition should hold big enough to drive a tank through. Coping with the incessant demands of weather and terrain was the first of many challenges for the tank crews. Tankers also had to learn how to fight effectively without putting their vehicles in unnecessary danger. Charging into battle at full throttle with guns blazing, as envisioned by pre-war armored theorists, had been tried by U.S. tanks during the early phases of the North Africa campaign in late 1942. But these tactics had caused huge losses from entrenched enemy anti-tank guns and were quickly abandoned. During the remainder of the conflict, U.S. tank warfare usually took on a decidedly less dashing personality. Tanks do not rush forward in the mechanized version of the flying wedge. They advance hesitatingly, like diffident fat boys coming across the floor at a party to ask for the next dance, stopping at the slightest excuse, going back, then coming on again. They are timid creatures. The vulnerability of tanks to a multitude of enemy anti-tank weapons brought about an important new relationship for the tank crews, a collaboration with the infantry. It was a partnership that would ultimately benefit both the men and their machines. The infantry were senior partners. They first decided how a position should be attacked and were then given an appropriate number of tanks to support them. The infantry scoured all bushes, hedges, and ditches to clear out any bazooka men or snipers. Each partner was aware of the difficulties and limitations of the other. If, in the event tanks suffered heavy casualties, they saved the lives of the infantrymen and the sacrifice was worthwhile. Infantrymen in World War II had the highest respect for tankers. Where an infantryman could dive for cover when under fire, tankers were trapped inside their vehicles, forced to keep moving until they were actually hit. We all liked tank men. We admired them. I would rather have been an infantryman than a tank man any day of the week. Might feel safer inside as long as nothing happens. You couldn't hope for a pleasant death if anything did happen. Shut up in a blazing steel room. One of the biggest obstacles to effective tank and infantry offensives was communication. In the early days of the war, the infantry lacked portable radios and were therefore unable to communicate with the crews of a buttoned-up tank. As a result, tank commanders were forced to improvise. It meant that the tank commander, me, either got out of the tank to talk to the infantry or an infantryman crawled up on the turret. We would turn the turret away from the Japanese. The tank commander's hatch was on a rotating ring and I would rotate that and put one of those hatch covers between me and the Japanese. It protected us from one direction. But God knows you could have gotten hit from anywhere. In the Pacific, Marine specialists solved the problem by attaching a telephone intercom on the back of the tanks, allowing safe and effective contact. Tank-to-tank -tank communication was also a problem with the early model AM radios, which were hampered by static and poor reception. The later development of noise-free FM radios allowed tankers to communicate effectively and coordinate their offensives. This combat recording from an anonymous Pacific island captures actual tank-to-tank -tank radio transmissions in a marine tank platoon. The infantry said that they'd like to have you fire over in them green villains about 11 o'clock to your left with the three stacks on. All right. Fire several rounds into that and to the other buildings around there. The infantry have requested it. Over. Good job. 
was one just a little long. Let's get this one in the building. We fired at 1,200 yard range, so make it about 1,500. Here we go with an HE. This is Congo to all vehicles. That should be sufficient for that building. But even when communication was good, the tactics of armor-infantry cooperation did not always work smoothly. They said it was a machine gun fire going into them from our vehicles. I don't think there is, but uh, that's what they said. 